Suppose that I gave you a challenge and it was to take this honey simulation and make it infinitely loop. So it's infinitely pouring onto the apple. How do you get a fluid simulation to do that? Well, that's what this quick tip is all about. Here in this scene, we have the simulation cached out. I'm not going to talk about how to make this simulation right now, but assuming that you have your water simulation there, the next step is to surface that simulation. So right now we're doing that through the particle fluid surface SOP. Now, one of your first instincts might be, okay, well, if we take a time shift and we just keyframe the values here of the range that we want, then we can get this to infinitely loop. So let's give that a shot real fast, see what happens. For this particular loop, I want to do that between frame 300 and frame 450. So we're going to find a range in general to make this loop with. In this case, it's 150 frames from 300 to 450. So let's set this down to manual real fast. Right click, say delete channels. And we're going to make a keyframe at frame 300. Then at frame 450, we're also going to make a keyframe. And if we go right in between there, so take a calculator, that is 150 divided by 2, 75 plus 300. Frame 375 is right in the middle. So let's go down here, say 375, and then keyframe this to 450. If I press Shift and Middle Mouse and hold down Spacebar G to frame this, you'll notice that we have this bell curve shape. And we start here at frame 300, we go up to 450, and then we go back down to 300. What does that look like? That will give us this. And there's a couple of issues with this. Yes, we are infinitely looping this simulation, but it's not very consistent. In other words, we have some frames that slow down, that speed up. Also, it's not like we have a continuous pour uh, of the honey. So in other words, it just doesn't feel very natural at all. It just feels like you sped up some film footage and then slowed it down and then pressed rewind or something like that. <laughs> Uh, so this approach is not going to work. We have to find a way to blend the shape that the simulation is making at frame 300 into a shape that is going to match somehow at frame 450. So this approach will not work. This is where we need to start thinking about things more creatively. How can we take one shape and blend it into another? Well, my first instinct is to use a blend shape node. A blend shape will take one piece of geometry and blend it into the shape of another piece of geometry. So what we could say is that I want a couple different versions of this simulation. Let's say that I have a time shift. Let's say that this is the green time shift down here. That will be our green color. And this is just playing the normal frame range right here. And let's say that I also have another time shift. Let's say that's going to be our yellow color. And this is going to be the current frame minus 150. Now, what would that do? Well, if we're at frame 450 and we subtract 150 from that, then that basically means that we're matching up to what we have in frame 300. So that's how we're going to loop this all together. So now all I need to do is I need to figure out how can I take the green shape and blend it into the yellow shape. Well, there is a node for that that we're going to use, and it's going to be the sequence blend node. So this S blend node down here. The reason why I'm using this and not the blend shape node is because we have this option to use velocity when interpolating the position. So, and that just gives us a smoother result basically. But let's go ahead and try to visualize this. Let's say that the honey is down here, okay? This is going to be the green shape. 
I need to figure out how to take the honey when it's down there as the green shape and point it towards, let's say, the border of this shape right here. And we just saw that in that sequence blend node, we have the ability to define velocity to say, hey, go in a direction. So now all we need to do is tell the points of the green version of our simulation to go in the direction of the yellow shape. And that's how we're going to blend those two shapes together. So let's make two time shifts to get this started. Again, we want one that is just the normal frame range. So that's $F. And we want another one that's going to be $F minus the length of our loop, which is 150 frames. That's going to, again, make sure that at frame 450, we get back to frame 300. Let's create a sequence blend and tie these two guys together. And by default, this is not going to work. If I go to the surface preview and we have this mesh, and let's say that I try to blend over to the other one, it's going to really glitch out like this. And that's because right now the points don't know where to look and we haven't specified a velocity telling it where to go. Let's check on this use velocity when interpolating position and then create a point wrangle to define this velocity and tell the stream over here which points it should go towards. Whenever I'm coding in VEX, I always like starting with the ingredients that I like to get from this operation. So what are those ingredients? Well, I like to define an integer attribute called ID. So I at ID is equal to something. And then I'd also like to specify a velocity. So V at V will be equal to something as well. Now, how are we going to get these ingredients? Well, for the ID, it makes sense for us to look for the nearest point on the other mesh and tell it that that's the target it wants to aim for. That's the ID it should keep in mind when trying to blend those two shapes. So I'm going to take our second input and plug that into this version of the sim. And I'm going to say, hey, use the near point function to find the nearest point. So near points that will return the ID of the nearest point that it finds. Let's go ahead and highlight that, press F1 on our keyboard and see what ingredients we need. So first of all, what GeoStream are we trying to look through? Index number one, that's the second input. So it says go over here and then we're going to use our position to find the nearest points and return the ID. We're going to assign that to a variable. We don't need to keep this information after the wrangle. So let's say integer find points is equal to near points like that. And then for our ID, we'll simply assign that to the find points. Great. Now, how are we going to figure out velocity? We can define a velocity vector by subtracting two positions. So our current position minus the position of another point. So let's go ahead and find that other point. And we can use that, or we can find that using the point function. So let's go ahead and see what the point needs. We need to, first of all, figure out the geometry to look through. So again, that's index number one. That's the second input. It says go over here. And what attribute are we trying to find? We are trying to find position. We want that as a string attribute name. So we need the quotations there. And then also what we want to do is specify the point number to gather that information from. We just found the ID using the near point function. So in this case, I can say find points and it knows which point to gather that info from. This will get assigned to a vector variable. So vector find position is equal to that. So now when defining our velocity, we could say take our current position minus the find position and that will create the vector. 
Now, I always get mixed up whether or not it's the position minus the found point or the found point minus the position. So let's go here to the point wrangle, turn on our velocity trails, and we can see that right now the viewport's kind of glitching out, but we are not facing the proper direction. Uh, so we need to invert this. So find position minus the current position. And now, as you can see, we have those vectors pointing to the nearest found point of the blend shape mesh. Okay, on this side, I find that it's also best to define an ID attribute over here, just in case we need to match up an ID attribute on this stream with this stream. So all I'll say in a point wrangle here is that this ID is equal to PTNum. There we go. So let's go ahead and hook everything up like so. We have ID as the point attribute to look for when matching things up. We're using velocity for that smoother interpolation over time. And if I start turning this up, we start turning into the other shape. I'm going to keyframe the input blend on our sequence blend from zero at frame 300 to one at frame 450. And if we hold down shift middle mouse, we can also change how quickly this happens. So spacebar G to frame that. I like to ease in like this with that animation. So with that being the case, what happens when we do a play blast? Okay, so yes, in fact, this does now work. And the nice thing about this kind of loop is that we are continuously pouring. We don't have those weird speed issues that were happening last time. And even though we have this glitchiness towards the edges, that's something we can clean up after the fact. All right, and there you go, guys. That is how you can make an infinite simulation with a water honey effect. Now, if you haven't heard, I also offer one-on-one -on -one mentorships and consultations. If you go to CG Forge, go to the Academy section right up here, and this allows you to book one-on-one -on -one consultations or set up mentorships so that I can help you achieve your Houdini goals more quickly. Besides that, I want to thank you for watching. I hope that this uh, sparks some fun ideas for you, and I hope you have a great day.